Okay, so let's review what we learned today. We started off with the story about the needle found in a para, in a cow that was being butchered in the base of Mikdash that was a carbon. The Mishnah, or the Brisa tells us that the meat that the needle is in is tame, yet the knife used to butcher the, butcher the meat, as well as the person, does not become tame. And we need to understand why the meat becomes tame, and why the knife and the person does not become tame. So the Gemara says, why are we concerned about any tum at all? This, not, this needle, we don't know its origins. So are you saying that a keli, whose origins we don't know, we have to assume that it's tame? The Gemara says in Yerushalayim, if you find a keli, you don't have to worry that it's tame, unless you found a keli on the way down to the mikveh or in the alleyway, that could be one of the ways to get into the mikveh. Because that would indicate that someone was taking it to Teubel, and he dropped it. But if you just find Kalem lying around on the streets of Yerushalayim, you don't need to worry about them being tummy. So why is this needle a concern, and why does it make the meat tummy? So the Gemara offers two explanations. Either the person cutting open the meat saw that needle and actually recognized the needle, and he knew that that needle once became an avatoma because a tame mace touched that needle. And that's why the needle is tame because we know for a fact that this needle became tame. Another opinion that was offered was we know this needle is not a keli that was found in the streets of Yerushalayim because this animal, as soon as it reached the city limits of Yerushalayim on its way to the base of Mikdash, was muzzled, which means this, this needle must have got into the animal before it came into Yerushalayim, and therefore we do have to be concerned that this needle is tame. As a byproduct of analyzing this brisa, we also learned that kalim in Yerushalayim that you find are not tame unless you find them on the way down to the mikveh. We also learned that saliva found on the streets of Yerushalayim can be assumed to become from a Tohar person because the tame people would congregate in one specific area. And everywhere else in Yerushalayim, we don't need to be concerned that the saliva is tummy. Let's get back to our meat that became tummy. It became tummy from this, from this needle. Now, if this needle is an avatoma, why is it that the person that touched it and the knife that touched it, why are they not tummy? So the Gemara introduces another new halacha, that tzavik tummy b'shus harabim sveikai tahar. Anytime we have a question of if tummy occurred and this scenario happened in a b'shus harabim, and this happened in the Azara, and the Gemara tells us that the Azara is considered a public place. It's considered a Rishos Arabim. Whenever there's a doubt about a Tumah that occurred in Rishos Arabim, we say that it's Tahar. So we don't know for sure that the knife touched the needle during the butchering process. We don't know that the human came into contact with the needle in the butchering process. So we say Misafik, it's Tahar, and this we learned out of Saita. The Gemara wants to suggest another reason why the knife should be Tahar. Because the knife is something she'ain by das l'shoyel. We cannot ask the knife, did you touch the needle or not? Because the knife does not have human intelligence. So that was suggested by the Gemara as another reason to say that the knife is tahar. The Gemara answered that since the knife is being operated by the human, and it's the human intervention that would have caused the tumma to occur, there it's considered a davar she'ish by das l'shoyel because of the human intelligence involved. And if it wasn't for the fact that this suffolk occurred, in the Rishos Arabim, we would not, uh, we would not make this tar. We would say that it's tummy. Then the Gemara says, "Okay, the meat became tummy, but we know that Michael has to be hochsher lekabel tuma before it can become tummy. I, the, the needle is tummy, and it will be tummy the meat. But first, the meat has to become hochsher. How did that happen?" So the Gemara had a couple of suggestions. If it was the dam or the water in the base of Mikdash in the butchering area, we already learned that those mashkin are not machsher to be mekabel tuma. So then the Gemara thought, well, maybe it's the fact that it's kachim, the meat is kachim, and the endearment of the kachim in and of itself makes it hukshir. Zok the Gemara, that's not a possibility either, because our Mishnah says that not only is the meat tame, the meat will actually be able to make other things tame. And if that's the case, Rishlokish wasn't sure if this hukshir of Chibas HaKodesh can actually create such a level of tumah that it could even be metame something else. So therefore the Gemara had to say, that the way this meat became Hukshala Kabotuma is because the owner of the carbon that was a shlamim brought the animal through the river to get really wet 
so that it would be easy to skin the animal after it was shechted. And the animal was so wet that that water from that river was still on the animal after it was shechted, and that was what was machshir, the animal, the meat of the animal to be makabal tumah. Then the Gemara taught us a very good way to remember how tumah, how tumah spreads. And it said, think of barley beer. When you make barley beer, you start off with a vessel, you put barley into it, adding the meichel, and then you add the liquid, you add the mashke. So this helps us understand how Tumah spreads. The sheretz will make the klicheres tamay, then the klicheres will make the meichel tamay, and then the meichel will make the mashke tamay. Then the Gemara discusses a very yesodistic halacha of how we know that the human and the keli can become a rishon Tumah but not a sheni, yet oichel and mashkin can become a sheni. And we know it from the Pasuk that the Torah taught us about things becoming Tom and Klicheris. It says, Kol Asher anything that anything that is inside a Klicheris, Yitma will be Tome, Mi Kola Oichel. So the Torah is telling us that the only thing that can become Tome inside a Klicheris is food, not a Kali. So this teaches us something very important. A it teaches us that the food that becomes tummy in the klicheris is not getting its tummy directly from the sherets that's hanging in the air. It's only getting it through the wall of the klicheris. It's telling us that since the wall of the klicheris is a reshine, it could make the food inside it into a sheni. But since the Torah says that a keli would not be able to become tummy by being inside the klicheris, it proves that a keli cannot become a sheni latuma. It could only become a reshine. And Rashi adds some more information. That Kalim and the people could not become anything less than a Risha in Latoma. And Rashi offers one exception, and that is if you're holding a Nevela in your hand, the Nevela is an Av and makes you into a Risha. So normally you wouldn't be able to be Matama anything else. But the Torah teaches us it is if while you're holding the Nevela, you have Kalim on you, such as clothing, or you're holding Kalim, there those Kalim would become Tome. So that's the exception to the rule. Normally, a keli cannot become anything less than a rishon. The only exception is if the keli is in the hands of a person while the person is actually holding onto an avela. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful Shabbos.